The following presentation is a gift from the team at Streamline Publishing, publishers of Fine Art Connoisseur, Plain Air Magazine, and weekly newsletters Fine Art Today, Realism Today, Plain Air Today, and American Watercolor, and events, the Plain Air Convention and the Figurative Art Convention. We offer over 400 different art instruction tutorials and ultra high quality video by the world's leading artists. If you like what you see, help us support our artists and our team with your purchase. Each video aired has a special discount code for today only in the comments section with a link to the video offered. And to see everything we do, or if you want to receive notice of new releases, new products, and new events for artists, simply click the other link, which says, see everything we do. Thank you. Hi there, I'm Eric Rhodes, publisher of Fine Art Connoisseur and Plein Air Magazine. Thank you for tuning in today. We're here every day at 3 p.m. The goal is to keep you focused and growing in art during, well, turbulent times. Today, we have a great video. It's called Storytelling in Watercolor with a great Japanese master, Keiko Tanabe. I'm a watercolor landscape artist. Today I'm traveling west, uh, west of Austin, Texas, and then I stumbled upon this, uh, what seemed like a ghost town with the cool buildings and an old barn and animals and typical Texas landscape. And it looks, looks very exciting and inspiring, so I decided to stop here and paint. I'd like to show you what I'm using. As a planner painter, I traveled with my planner gear all the time, and this is what I travel with. And as a tripod, I'm using very lightweight, portable, uh, easy to set up, easy to pack up type. Um, and that's um, always in my uh, backpack. And then I have a paper sitting on top of it, which I use uh, with a huge clip uh, because it's just sitting on top of it. I need to, to secure it, hold it down with a huge clip. And then on the tray right here, I have a metal watercolor palette with all the colors inside already and a few brushes, and a pencil, and an eraser. So um, let's talk about my paper. Here I'm using 14 by 20 on uh, the landscape format, and then uh, the surface is rough. I like a little texture on the surface. Uh, I use either rough or cold press, and there's another kind, hot press uh, watercolor paper, uh, which I use sometimes, but most of the time I, I like um, the texture because uh, some of the techniques I, I prefer work very well on the, on the not so smooth paper. How I prepare my paper is just like this. I put um, masking tape on all sides and then uh, put the sheet of paper on the board, sturdy board. And that's done. Very easy. In my palette, uh, I travel um, with all the colors in inside already and I have 14 colors today. And it's very basic, a very limited palette. I have a um, few colors from each primary and then and a few of my favorites in addition to that. And I will tell you uh, right now uh, the colors I'm using for this particular painting. The first one is lemon yellow, next one yellow ochre, and then quinacridone gold. And I have Windsor orange, cadmium red, Adizarin Crimson, Cobalt Blue, French Ultramarine, and this is Windsor Violet, Burnt Sienna, Burnt Amber, and the last one is Neutral Tint. Um, a little bit about the Neutral Tint is because I don't normally use this color in my painting, uh, but I use this to do a tonal study. Uh, I, I prefer mixing my darks, so I use uh, different colors from this area to create something like this. And on this side, I have a few opaque colors and a white. This one is called lavender, cobalt turquoise, viridian, and the last one is titanium white. I know some of the watercolors don't like using white, and I don't use it either, but sometimes there are cases when I have to rely on it. Uh, for example, I do believe in the beauty of showing the whiteness of the paper for the highlight, and I try to do that too. 
but sometimes it's just difficult for me to paint around uh, certain things. Uh, if a shape is too small or too complicated, I just paint over it and at the end I put a little white inside. Or sometimes I mix a different color to white to create opaque color that I don't have. So sometimes it can be very useful, so that's why I, I have it. So that's my palette. Now let me show you my brushes. I have a few of my favorites, which are always with me in my travel bag. Now, uh, to begin, I usually use something like this. First of all, the size, it's huge. And this is number 20, round brush. Uh, it's synthetic, but it's just like a natural hair. It's very soft and absorbent. That's the kind of brush I need because it can hold a lot of water. So I can do uh, the first wash uh, very quickly uh, without uh, going uh, to my palette so many times. After the first wash is complete, I I do use a variety of brushes actually to do the small details and in you know it doesn't have to be the small brush like this one it's number 16 which is uh, quite large but it has a it has a fine tip so I can do the even the smallest detail with this brush and then the other ones uh, you know all different types I switch from one to another to create a different brush marks and but you will see uh, how I use this in my painting and then other few things that may be useful. Uh, the spray bottle, uh, which I use sometimes to, uh, to create the texture in my painting, and also to keep the paper moist longer. Or uh, a planner day like today, uh, which is very uh, dry and windy, my palette gets dry so quickly. I have to keep my paints moist, so I spray my inside my palette often with this spray bottle. Another tool I, I like uh, to carry with me is a palette knife. Not to paint with, uh, but sometimes I scratch it out, but sometimes I actually paint with this one, uh, not in a big space. Uh, I usually carry this one. And my pencil case, I have a um, drafting pencil. This is what I use to do my drawing before I paint. And then also eraser. And a few other pencils inside, um, like, um, this one, this is a water soluble pencil, and uh, sometimes I use this to do a sketch. And also, uh, speaking of sketching, I, uh, I can't leave home without my sketchbook. Today I'm using this one, and I actually, starting a painting, uh, I, I really need to make sure, I really need to be confident about my co uh, comp composition. So I do usually uh, compositional sketches inside my sketchbook, and sometimes I do not just one, uh, more, than, more than one, uh, different composition. So just to try out to see which one looks better. Uh, but if you do a uh, tonal sketch with one, two values, light and dark, uh, that should be enough. Especially outside, the sun moves and the light, with it, light changes and values change as well. It can be quite confusing. So if you don't know the values in your painting, uh, if you don't decide uh, beforehand, Especially with the watercolor, it's so difficult to change, uh, change your mind uh, once you start it. So uh, I think values, it's imperative that you know uh, before you begin and then uh, do a sketch. So even if the light changes, uh, you will never be confused. Lots of times, ideal location is not very close to the parking. So you are expected to walk and if you carry too much, that would discourage you. And then maybe you can't find the most beautiful spot. So um, let's keep that in mind and keep your uh, material minimum. To start uh, painting uh, on location, I usually carry a little sketchbook like this and do a little sketch. For this scene, uh, I walked around first just to get the feel. I think it's very important to take time and observe and just soak it, soak it in and then feed it with all your senses, the sight and the smell and the feel of the air and the light. If you feed it uh, in your body, I think uh, it's easier to paint because you're already emotionally connected to the subject. So uh, I did that uh, when I arrived and also did a little sketch. The sketching is very important for me, especially outside. Um, it's uh, sometimes difficult to, to arrive at the best composition 
So well, it's, um, and also sometimes I have to make um, things move, rearrange shapes. So I do sometimes uh, several sketches, but in this case, I found a good spot where I can find a nice composition so I don't have to uh, move things around or make uh, drastic changes. So this is a little sketch right here I did for the street scene. I have this, uh, the beautiful building, blue building. It says Hotel, Hotel de Paris. Um, so I can imagine all days and people coming here and uh, staying here and all the horses um, parked and right in front and it's just um, exciting. And then I put another building, which I don't see right now, but behind this hotel, um, when I walked uh, around, I saw an old barn. So I decided to put another building in the back just to show the depth. And this is street. And right now there is no activity. But again, I'm imagining uh, the little busier street scene. So I put a truck and maybe a couple of people walking. So um, that will become lively. So this is my idea for the composition. And also I shaded um, some of the things that I, I like to use darks. So like trees in the back and inside the hotel. And then maybe some shadows coming from this direction. I use darks, but otherwise the rest of the painting will be very light because it's a beautiful sunny day and everything is in the light. So I like to capture that light and also the atmosphere of the sunny uh, countryside in Texas. First of all, I like uh, to draw on my paper. Without drawing, it's um, very difficult for me to uh, paint. Uh, but I have to tell you that drawing is, uh, for me, is just a guideline. So I don't really draw everything. Uh, first, the composition. So usually in the landscape painting, I try to find the horizon and try to determine why I want the horizon. So this may be uh, my horizon line. And so the foreground and the background. Horizon usually divides the paper into two parts, the foreground and background. So, uh, after that, foreground is a street. I'm thinking a little bit of perspective to show the road this way. So, this um, pretty much in the mid-ground is going to be that hotel, blue hotel. So, I will try to put that big shape in. I don't like to start drawing with the small uh, details. I like to show um, bigger shapes first in my drawing. So this um, hotel is a two-story. I'm dividing the shape into two parts. So this is the middle. And then above is the sky. So actually the drawing shouldn't take a long time. But it should be uh, accurate, especially the street scene there with the perspective. And the accurate drawing um, is quite important. So the top part is a bit complicated. Like this. And there's a door. So after I put the big shape in, I will do, and I'm okay with it, I will put the small details inside. Never the other way around. A couple windows, one side and more on the other side, like that. And then the sunny side, the street side of the buildings, actually this building goes uh, far um, in the back uh, behind the hotel. There are more shops and, and even jail. And then it's quite interesting, but from here, we don't really see it, so it's uh, just a hotel. With the fences.
Yeah, it's a little detail, so I'm trying to, to be as accurate as possible. Although I'm not aiming for 100% accuracy. Um, important historic building like this, uh, I try to show a little bit more detail without changing much. If not, sometimes I'm, I might make a big change uh, to even reshape uh, the original building. So, but I quite like the look, so even copying or the drawing literally. So there are steps down. So this is really the most important part and the most difficult part in terms of drawing. And then I, I had to really concentrate. But otherwise, and the rest of the drawing, uh, it's fairly easy. So I can start thinking about other things while drawing. Um, I do a lot of thinking when I, when I draw. Uh, of course, composition is one, uh, but um, the values, and it's, um, this is not the value study, and then I just align um, drawing without showing any values. Uh, if I want to, uh, I can shade the darks uh, even directly on the paper, but normally I don't do that. So the value sketch is something I do separately, or at least think about in my head, and it's uh, without uh, the plan for the, uh, the strong value pattern uh, for the lights and darks. Uh, I think uh, I struggle when I paint. So uh, that's something I need to decide before I put any color on the paper. So this is a good time to think about if I don't do value study in the sketchbook. Uh, I do encourage though, and I, I should do the value study each time on the sketchbook, a separate sheet of paper. Um, but sometimes I just dive in and start painting. Uh. So uh, the, my drawing, uh, the hotel is the most difficult one, uh, the part. So that's done. The rest is quite simple. And then the fewer uh, details than the typical street scene, like urban street scene. Uh, I, I have to do more drawing. But this is quite uh, simple. Um, but now I'm doing uh, something I don't really see. Uh, but actually, I saw an old truck in the back. I think that would be neat to put it in. So, I'm doing that old truck, as I remember. Something like that. And then probably um, people. I always uh, try to create a uh, story in the painting. So it's not just a depiction of the scene or the landscape. Uh, it's about more about the people's life. So I'm thinking maybe a couple of people. Talking. It's all imagination, but can be done easily uh, as long as you have a bigger shape, so you you can determine the appropriate size. Okay, so I think uh, my drawing is finished, um, and I'm okay with the values and the light in the sky and the and pretty much everywhere except uh, the trees in the back, uh, right here and right here. And also I darken under the, the balcony of the hotel because it's in the shadow of the balcony. So, and then also uh, everything, uh, the car, uh, the truck and the people and the fence, everything uh, in the sun uh, should have shadows underneath. So uh, that's the plan for the values. And also another thing I think about when I draw is uh, edges. In watercolor, you can create hard and soft edges. And then uh, maybe something uh, between the two, like lost and found edge. 
So if you employ all of the edges in your work, I think it will look more interesting. And then also uh, to create a certain atmosphere, you do have to use uh, different edges, not just hard edges, not just soft edges, a balance, uh, good balance of both edges. That's what I try to do in my work. So in this case, um, I have to use, because everything I see has a hard edge, I have to change uh, here and there to create the soft edges. So maybe that's um, what I had to maybe decide right now, because especially the soft edge, you really need to work on the wet paper. And if you don't have a plan for that, uh, you will create a hard edge and then have to soften it afterwards, which is very difficult to do. It's better to know uh, beforehand uh, where, the, where you want the soft edge and then just before you do it, uh, you wet the paper if it's not wet. Uh, if it's already wet, that's fine, uh, but don't wait too long. And so that's the kind of thing that I think about. And in this painting, I'm thinking maybe some vegetation, soft edges, and maybe a um, little bit inside um, um, in the dark and the shadows uh, or the details. I didn't even draw doors and windows. Maybe I'll use soft edges and just su to suggest those things in the shadow. So with that, with that plan, uh, I'm good to go. Now I'm going to start painting. Now I'm going to start painting. Uh, on a day like this, um, very dry and windy, everything dries so fast. So it's uh, imperative that you don't stop too often or don't paint too slowly or keep the spray at hand and maybe even spray the directly to the painting to keep, uh, keep it moist. Everything dries up so quickly and also my, in, in the palette as well, all the paints, I make sure they stay moist, fresh and moist. That's very important. So spray bottle actually to me for planner painting, this is the most important thing. Where to begin? I, I put uh, the colors everywhere uh, in the first wash from um, top to bottom. Uh, sometimes bottoms up and I, I can start anywhere. But usually I think of the next step. If um, a plane, uh, the front, the mid and, the, and also the back um, needs a second layer, um, sometimes I can finish with one layer. But lots of times the mid-ground needs a second layer and sometimes a foreground as well. I usually um, paint mid or foreground first because that uh, first layer needs to dry for the second layer to be put on. But usually the sky is done with one layer so I can do it and finish in the beginning or I can just um, do it actually anytime. So I think I'm going to start from mid-ground because mid-ground needs a second layer and then and I need to dry it. So first color I'm looking for is a dirt, dirt color. I'm mixing burnt sienna and the yellow ochre and then put it in here and then with a big brush to cover the, the bottom third as quickly as possible. Well, I accidentally picked a French ultramarine. That's fine. I integrate it into the wash. And actually that uh, works, uh, that works just fine. Uh, I could use this as a shadow later on. Small or big, accidents do happen uh, while you paint. But the important thing is to take care of it uh, before it becomes a problem, before it's dry. If you do that each time accident happens, you have no problem. I'm putting a little bit more pigment towards uh, the end of the road. And actually, I'm going to make it slightly darker. So, so it won't be uh, even 
wash. It's more like a grated wash. And I'll wait a little bit. With the wind and the dry air, it's, gonna, it's not going to take a long time. I want to splash a um, few um, with the water. I want to splatter a little bit in the foreground to show a little bit more texture. This is a dirt road and it's not really smooth. It's bumpy. Like this, I'm splattering uh, with a clean water. So I think um, that's done for the moment. So and I'm going to move on to the rest of the painting. Cleaning my brush thoroughly because I don't want to use this color anymore. I'm thinking maybe I can do the sky and I'm looking at the color of the hotel that's almost the color of the sky maybe I can do both at the same time I'm mixing uh, cobalt blue and the lavender uh, to begin with and maybe a little bit of touch of turquoise for the hotel So uh, around here, I'm um, putting the color mixture and I'm thinking of leaving the, the whites uh, for the, just about, uh, below the balcony. And then maybe I would do the same for the top of the structure. I don't want to worry too much because the first wash it's um, uh, just to put the colors in and I without worrying about the small details. But like I said if there's anything white and it's, it's better kept white I will try my best to show that by painting around. But the rest um, I, I don't want to do that and I'll just put the color everywhere. And then taking full advantage of this big brush, put in the color, um, the same color mixture as quickly as possible. But no more turquoise, just blue and a touch of lavender. That's what I'm working with. Maybe I can show a little bit of clouds now that I see the clouds. And a little bit of clouds, suggestion, by showing uh, the whites here and there randomly. Because I gave the sky area. It's quite a big space. So if it's too flat, uh, if it's um, just blue with no clouds, that would look a little too simple, I think. So that color uh, now cover the top part of the paper. Now I'm using this blue a little bit in the, this area, uh, the pasture. Uh, the grass coming down the hill. I'm gonna do that. So I mixed queen gold, kinakoridan gold, and a little bit of uh, turquoise to put the color right here, and a little bit in the um, in the road as well. So like that. And also the other side, uh, just brushing it, brushing it in to suggest um, grass. In the foreground, at this point, I don't want too much harshness, so I will spray uh, to soften the edges. And if it runs too much, and I just use tissue 
to create soft edges until I'm happy with it. So uh, this moment, um, I want to do a little bit more. I'm thinking, um, I'm, I'm seeing actually some flowers, yellow flowers. So I'm going to just splash some yellows to suggest flowers on both sides. And as always, and when, they, when the wind blows, whenever I want to do this, and then making spots go all over the place. But that's fine. Like I said, if uh, the spots fall on the summer, you know, the other areas where I don't want to see it, just take care of it before it dries. Right now, some in the hotel, um, you know, that's fine, and that'll be covered with trees, and, and this is not too much, so I'm, uh, I'm not worried about it. And I'm thinking maybe I could have put the color, uh, this color for the barn. Yeah, this is um, the barn I moved from the, the back of the hotel. I just felt um, I needed another building. If not, uh, the reality is just trees and it's a little bit too much to show trees behind the hotel. So now um, I'm touching the paper. And then my plan was to show a little bit more softness um, in this tree. And then again, this uh, dry air and the wind and then dries everything instantly. So I had to spray a little bit. Picture this. You clear a whole day on your schedule just for painting. With excited anticipation and a desire to create something amazing, you set everything up and get right to it. And then it happens. You stress and struggle about every little detail. What to include, what not to include. Is that even the right color? Is that part dry yet? When is this thing gonna be done? At the end of what you thought would be the best day ever, you step back, take a hard look at your intended masterpiece, and only see a painting that is flat and lifeless. Don't worry, we've all been there. You just haven't learned yet what really talented artists already know. How to use every second of time to productively progress through a painting, and how not to get stuck in unnecessary details so you can get to the heart of your painting quickly and efficiently. Welcome to Storytelling with Watercolor with artist Keiko Tanabe. In this workshop style video, paint right along with Keiko as she shows you how to choose what's important for your paintings, what to leave out, and when to imply objects rather than detailing them in. It is necessary and important to simplify. The tendency is to put in everything, every single detail. So you really need to just get the essence by simplifying. Let go of agonizing over every brush stroke and discover faster ways to incorporate details like flowers, grasses, and trees. Even a single brush can do so many different things. We really need to take time to learn how to use them. Get really strategic about edges so that you can take full advantage of wet into wet opportunities. Know when to step back from your painting and call it finished. By utilizing Keiko's methods, you'll soon be creating gorgeous paintings that invite viewers in, leading them through a natural rhythm, allowing them to take in everything that is there and all that is only implied. Your paintings will have a loose and vibrant look and feel to them, and you'll delight in the satisfaction of finishing more higher quality paintings and more quickly than you ever have. Just, um enjoy it. We shouldn't be intimidated. Uh, we shouldn't be worried too much. There are some things that you need to plan ahead, but otherwise just have fun. Stop spending your precious paint time feeling frustrated and dissatisfied with your work. Add Storytelling with Watercolor with Keiko Tanabe to your resource library today, and soon you'll be applying her proven techniques that allow you to tell your stories your way in your own beautiful paintings. Available on DVD or as a digital download.
Buy your copy today. Well, that is Keiko Tanabe, storytelling in watercolor. You can learn more about the full-length video at lilyartvideo.com, and you can get a special discount today only if you go to the comments section. You can find it right in there in the comments section and get that discount code and apply it for today only. I tell you that? All right, let's get right to our interview with Keiko Tanabe. I started painting full-time 2005. Um, that's the year when I quit my job, day job, which was not art. I was a marketing person, an international law firm, and to paint. And so that was the beginning as a professional, the full-time painter. But even before that, I played uh, the sketching, drawing, painting. Uh, I used all kinds of things, uh, so just for fun. When I was six years old, my parents signed me up for children's art contest, which was outside. And I didn't know about it, and I just uh, went uh, because my parents told me and painted in the mountain. It was a springtime. It was such a pleasant experience, and I loved it. And then, best of all, I got an award, which was a nice box of crayons and, and, and a drawing board. I was so thrilled. And so after that, I, every time, whenever there was a plein air contest or competition, I, I just went, and then I, and by doing that on often, I became more and more fond of being outside the paint. So I think that's really the beginning of my plein air artist life. I had to uh, confess that I like being outside. So in a way, because of that, I chose landscape as my favorite subject. Uh, but second of all, uh, the landscape uh, is not just uh, the landscape for me. For me, uh, it's people, more about the people. I'm interested in uh, the, how people live and just uh, trying to depict the daily slice of life and everybody. So landscape is just a setting where people live. So that's what I try to paint. I think people know me as a landscape painter. I, I do natural landscape, but more than, uh, more than that, I, I like cityscapes. Um, I, I like um, depicting people's daily lives and so where, where I, wherever I can find people, it doesn't have to be hustle bustle of the big city. Uh, that becomes uh, automatically my favorite subject. And, but also because I like people, uh, I'm uh, very attracted to and also do uh, c quite often, just for fun, uh, the portraits, uh, the figures, uh, not the landscape. So, and I, in the future, I like to do more of that. But at this moment, uh, I think people know me as a landscape artist. When I go outside uh, to paint, I don't really have anything in mind. I just pick a place or maybe I see something and then I start walking around and try to soak it in, try to feel the air, to see the light. So um, whatever speaks to me, that's what I, you know, the first thing that speaks to me, that's what I paint. But most of the time I found uh, that is the contrast. I'm more attracted to uh, the light and dark, you know, interplay of both more than anything, more than colors, more than um, uh, the beautiful flowers or the historical monuments. I think it's important to set the mood or the tone uh, in the beginning um, because uh, when I um, stand in front of my paper, staring at the blank sheet of paper, uh, I like to see the finished painting there, uh, even before I put a drawing there. And then I try to visualize um, taking in the inspiration, try to interpret it in my own way, and then create an image in my mind. And then try to project it, uh, to visualize it, and then project it on the, on the paper. So um, wh what I do in the drawing is try to, to, try to show it uh, with my pencil lines. So that part is extremely important for me. Without it, uh, none of my paintings have happened. I describe my style of painting as um, impressionistic. Uh, it's not abstract, it's not the realism. I, it's a little bit of both. And I do try to uh, incorporate uh, the abstract quality and then the bit of realism. Uh, I'm not really interested in photorealism. Uh, I, I like uh, you know, the simplicity of an uh, impressionistic style. And you know, it's to, just to catch the essence of uh, a scene or whatever I'm painting, uh, I have to paint that way. And not to show everything, but just the important thing. Others just in, uh, the suggestion. I think uh, after trying uh, most of the mediums out there, I chose watercolor. 
uh, is because first um, I, I, wa I was looking for something uh, easy to travel with. I, I'm a traveler all my life. <laughs> so I wanted to start sketching uh, when I'm on the road. So the watercolors seemed to be the easiest um, you know, to take with me. And I found out it was not the easiest to, to work with, but <laughs> that's the first reason. Another reason is that uh, the, some of the brush uh, techniques are a little similar to calligraphy I used to do when I was a child. The watercolor, this medium, has a mind of its own. You know, it's, uh, if you are deep into it, you know, if you do this, uh, you probably have developed a love-hate relationship. And I do too. I, I love it and I hate it. <laughs> I love it because, it's, because of the elusive quality. And uh, you know, you never know what happens. You're working with the water. So I love that part. But at the same time, it's a huge headache <laughs> because it's impossible to control water. And you just have to work with it and just not to fight it. So that, you know, uh, push and pull, uh, uh, that, that's what I feel like when I work with the watercolor. It has to be, uh, you have to just find the rhythm. If you push, uh, and then after that you pull. And then that, uh, if you uh, find the rhythm of your painting, I think the result will be good. If I like to give one piece of advice to a beginning uh, watercolor artist painter, painter is um, buy yourself a good sheet of paper. And a lot of people I, I, I see uh, using in, in a poor quality paper as practice, uh, maybe they think it doesn't matter, but it does matter. You know, the paper makes a big difference. So um, if you need to save up money to buy a high quality paper, that should be the beginning. If I can choose five things I would like uh, um, my viewers to learn from it, um, painting sessions. Uh, first of all, um, it is necessary and important um, to simplify. You know, the outside, um, or even if you, if you work from a photo, you see all the details, and the tendency is to put in everything, every single detail. And that's not, uh, in my opinion, good. Uh, so you really need to uh, just get the essence by simplifying. So my way of simplifying each subject, each time is different, but if you can get uh, some idea how I do it, uh, that's, uh, that's great. And the second, maybe, um, you know, the drawing. Uh, when I do a drawing, I do a lot of mental work, uh, preliminary work, and that is uh, crucial for a successful painting. So I did talk about it, and so I hope uh, when you begin a painting, at least you think about those things and make choices. Watercolor is uh, unforgiving. It's, uh, it's not easy to make changes once you start. So that's second. And then uh, number three, maybe um, the colors. Everybody loves colors, I do too. But to work with a huge palette of dozens of different colors is not gonna do. I think uh, having a limited palette uh, it's one of the first things that you, maybe you have to do if you don't have it already. So my color choices, uh, if you like the colors I use, uh, I hope uh, you will um, maybe consider uh, the similar palette. And uh, number four, maybe uh, brushes. Uh, of course, uh, there are all kinds of brushes out there. And then about each brush, and even a single brush can do so many different things. We really need to take time to learn how to use them. Um, so, you know, the little brush marks I created, uh, you know, just a few brushes. Everything was done with a few brushes. And the last thing, uh, just um, enjoy it. I think, uh, you know, watercolor is forgiving. I, I mentioned that, I know, but we shouldn't be intimidated. Uh, we shouldn't be worried too much. And, uh, as I see, many students are, are afraid uh, of water, afraid of darks, afraid of other things. But watercolor is not the beast. <laughs> it can be a friend. So I think uh, you just have to not to worry too much. There are some things that you need to um, plan ahead, but otherwise just have fun. Well, that is the great Keiko Tanabe, and the video is called Storytelling with Watercolor. And you can learn more about the full length video at lilyartvideo.com. Remember, there's a special discount code on that video today only. Just look for it in the comments section. 
I want to remind you guys that we have a publication called American Watercolor. If you're into watercolor, you will like it. Just go to AmericanWatercolor.net. Also, I want to tell you that we have a free video for you. It's two hours in length, over $100 value. It's called 97 Amazing Painting Secrets from the World's Best Masters. You can get it at 97tips.com. Thank you for watching. I'm Eric Rhodes. We'll see you tomorrow at 3. Picture this. You clear a whole day on your schedule just for painting. With excited anticipation and a desire to create something amazing, you set everything up and get right to it. And then it happens. You stress and struggle about every little detail. What to include, what not to include. Is that even the right color? Is that part dry yet? When is this thing going to be done? At the end of what you thought would be the best day ever, you step back, take a hard look at your intended masterpiece, and only see a painting that is flat and lifeless. Don't worry, we've all been there. You just haven't learned yet what really talented artists already know. How to use every second of time to productively progress through a painting and how not to get stuck in unnecessary details so you can get to the heart of your painting quickly and efficiently. Welcome to Storytelling with Watercolor with artist Keiko Tanabe. In this workshop style video, paint right along with Keiko as she shows you how to choose what's important for your paintings, what to leave out, and when to imply objects rather than detailing them in. It is necessary and important to simplify the tendency is to put in everything, every single detail. So you really need to just get the essence by simplifying. Let go of agonizing over every brush stroke and discover faster ways to incorporate details like flowers, grasses, and trees. Even a single brush can do so many different things. We really need to take time to learn how to use them. Get really strategic about edges so that you can take full advantage of wet into wet opportunities. Know when to step back from your painting and call it finished. By utilizing Keiko's methods, you'll soon be creating gorgeous paintings that invite viewers in, leading them through a natural rhythm, allowing them to take in everything that is there and all that is only implied. Your paintings will have a loose and vibrant look and feel to them, and you'll delight in the satisfaction of finishing more higher quality paintings and more quickly than you ever have. Just um, enjoy it. We shouldn't be intimidated. Uh, we shouldn't be worried too much. There are some things that you need to plan ahead, but otherwise, just have fun. Stop spending your precious paint time feeling frustrated and dissatisfied with your work. Add Storytelling with Watercolor with Keiko Tanabe to your resource library today, and soon you'll be applying her proven techniques that allow you to tell your stories your way in your own beautiful paintings. A 